Good morning, beautiful people. Welcome to another episode of Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. It's actually evening, nighttime, um, because my next guest is from India, from Bangalore, India. His name is S.L. Kenton, and this is episode 36. I can't wait for it. He's a geopolitical uh, analyst, and he has a background in technology, but um, we're going to learn a little bit more about him, and we're going to talk a lot about um, currency, um, trading around the world with regards to the U.S. dollar and the hegemony that's under threat. So when you talk about other currencies, the BRICS alliance with Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and other countries, uh, we have just quite a bit to talk about today. Maybe some Ukraine, Russia, even though we've exhausted that a little bit on the forum. But I want to say, SL, thanks for accepting that invitation and welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Kiko. Yes. And so just for my audience that may not know who you are, um, kind of give them where you're from, um, kind of describe the area you're from in India, and also like your background in education. Like, how do you get to develop such a sharp geopolitical analysis? Okay. So, uh, well, I'm in uh, Bangalore, India, which is sort of uh, the Silicon Valley of India. So I worked in uh, technology for a long time. And about uh, in uh, about 2008 or nine, you know, I started to uh, wonder uh, what's happening with the world, you know, like in terms of the uh, financial uh, the crisis and so on. I was kind of shocked. It's like, well, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, but these guys are supposed to be so smart, all these uh, bankers and all these Countries are supposed to be so rich, and now they're just uh, 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 going uh, belly up in just a matter of few days. And then they have all these excuses. Oh, yeah, we sold uh, the homes, you know, for uh, zero down payment to people who have no salary. I'm like, what's going on? How could that happen? You know? And then I started uh, to investigate, to read. And then I found that uh, like everything in the world is actually uh, linked. You know, you start with real estate, and then you find out about how banks work, how the corporations work, and then you actually find out that all of uh, the corporations are, are like actually the same. You know, so you think that oh, there's Pepsi and uh, uh, but Coca-Cola, and they are f uh, fighting with one another in a uh, free market. And then you go take a uh, look at uh, the largest uh, shareholders of uh, Pepsi and uh, Coca-Cola. They are the same. Okay, so both companies are owned by the same people. You know, a few like uh, BlackRock and uh, State Street, Vanguard. Bank of America, and you'll find these uh, four or five names in uh, the largest uh, shareholders of all large companies, right? So, you, you know, you look at uh, uh, Walmart, uh, uh, Bank of America, uh, 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 Lockheed Martin, whatever uh, big corporation, you know, Facebook, Google, and you think that they're all like so different and they're all working independently in this beautiful uh, free market. And then you find out, hold on, uh, there's no free market. They're all owned by just uh, one people with just uh, various different names. Um, and then you look at the food, uh, the healthcare, wars, uh, the mainstream media, Oh my God, it's all just one big uh, giant family and we're not a part of it. That's a great way to put it. Um, for sure, it seems like um, we get so caught up in these labels and we've talked about this on the forum. We try to stick to the empirical information and avoid the labels. Labels can be important, but they need to be contextualized um, within the situation. And we don't do that. A lot of times it's just a sweeping statement with taken out of context, but um, the consolidation of power is something that's a universal phenomenon, unfortunately. And a lot of what you're describing is a consolidation of power, whether it's a media company, 
you talk about the top six companies in the United States, pretty much control all the information um, that we see on television, that we listen to on the airwaves and radio. And we, and we argue about this back and forth, the blue and the red team, but they're both responsible for passing the 1996 Telecommunications Act that sent, basically brought censorship into a whole nother level. And then you have Bush with the Patriot Act. And you have all these different things that are that basically agreed upon by the corporate parties that work together in unison, but they disguise themselves as different based on a bunch of um, circus type issues, um, whether it's identity politics or anything else, while we're still being impoverished as people, that the banks are taking our money and the rig stock market and everything else is just screwing the working class, basically. And so... Um, the same people who are feeding the information to us are in collaboration, like you said, with the bankers and everybody else. And so it's just it's just a, a fish trying to chase its tail constantly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, it's just so sad that how uh, the U.S. has become so polarized, you know, uh, the Democrats versus Republicans and uh, like what's happening to... Uh, uh, but Trump now, you know, this is like the first time in uh, the history of uh, the U.S., you know, and it's like, on. Uh, I mean, this is, you know, whether you are a uh, liberal or a uh, conservative, this is very bad for uh, the country, you know, uh, there should be uh, people, you know, bringing Americans together, you know, so there's only uh, one America, you know, and if you're going to split that into half, and especially, you know, uh, what's going to happen in uh, the next uh, the 10 years, uh, uh, like you mentioned, uh, BRICS and uh, de-dollarization, uh, uh, the rise of uh, China. Um, uh, the U.S. is going to face a lot of troubles, you know, like a lot of uh, the economic uh, troubles, uh, uh, the leadership or, I mean, I mean, uh, the hegemony of uh, the U.S. is going to change, you know, uh, but nobody's really uh, but talking about it and saying, hey, guys, uh, so let's all come together. And uh, uh, we have these huge uh, but challenges in uh, the next uh, but 10 years or so. And we need to work together as uh, one country. And rather than that, people are doing crazy things like starting wars with Russia. <laughs> Hello, uh, 6,000 uh, 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 nuclear weapons and uh, 1,500 of them uh, can be launched right now with just uh, one button, you know? And it's not a joke, you know? And they have these like uh, super fast, I mean, are hypersonic missiles and uh, uh, so nothing can uh, stop them, you know? So you keep uh, pushing Russia into uh, the corner. Uh, they're not going uh, to dissolve. Uh, they're not going to be uh, uh, defeated, you know? Because it's uh, the US and uh, the NATO uh, uh, that kept expanding and expanding over the last uh, about 25 years. And uh, the U.S. goes and arms and funds uh, the Nazis. I mean, like, real Nazis, okay? So, uh, uh, but these are not, like, uh, the Trump supporter, uh, the Nazis, you know, very soft, uh, very uh, mild, <laughs> you know? I mean, these are, like, hardcore Nazis, and you just have to go on uh, social media and you see these uh, the Ukrainian soldiers, you know, wearing all uh, the symbols from uh, the Hitler's days, you know, and they've been uh, 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 like murdering uh, the ethnic Russians uh, who are like uh, uh, forty percent of the population in uh, Ukraine, and uh, the Ukrainian. Uh, uh, the government and uh, the Nazis, they have been uh, murdering uh, the ethnic Russians for the last uh, nine years. 
you know, and uh, the world never uh, were talked about it. So, uh, so Russia is not going to back down. It's like uh, their, I mean, uh, the existential uh, crisis, you know. So just imagine if uh, uh, Russia and uh, China, uh, 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 they supported like an anti-American government in uh, Mexico, and uh, Russia was, uh, uh, was sending them guns and tanks and missiles, what would uh, the U.S. do? Mm -hmm. You know, you know they will be like, hey, buddy, uh, uh, we're going to spread you some uh, freedom and democracy, you know? So, uh, 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 but this war is just totally needless and just uh, like putting uh, the whole of uh, uh, the U.S. in danger and uh, the whole world in danger. Yes, absolutely. And um, and basically everyone I've had on, I've had three analysts come on to discuss the Russia-Ukraine situation based on the book Flashpoint in Ukraine, how the U.S. drive for hegemony, risk World War III. I've um, promoted that book several times. It was published in 2014 because a lot of people think that this crisis started out of thin air. But this has been an ongoing situation, really, during around the collapse of the Soviet Union, you could argue, and even before then. But it really escalated in 13 with the coup. And um, we've talked about that on the forum quite a bit. And even people within that same uh, collaboration of Flashpoint in Ukraine, even though there were differing opinions, they all agreed that um, this was a provoked war. And this war was inevitable because of NATO expanding to the east. And um, basically everything you said about um, the, the threat of nuclear war um, is a legitimate threat. And um, our information channels are really closed off because we're in the West and the East. And we're going to get into that some. Um, I'm glad you mentioned Russia and Ukraine because uh, I think my audience has a pretty good grasp of it now. But it is important within the context of the world when we talk about um, not only geopolitics, but culture, economics, and everything else that's linked. Um, I had a question. I've been thinking about India as such a big country. I think it's the seventh largest in area, and you have 1.4 billion people. And based on some of the articles I read, it actually is arguably has a larger population than China now, or it's at least at the very, very much on par with China's population. 1.4 billion people. Um, how does how where does India fit in this world of geopolitics as far as um, its influence locally and globally? So, I mean, so it's sort of I mean, uh, so it's kind of a uh, uh, mixed bag. On uh, uh, one hand, uh, the population itself it gives India. Uh, some uh, leverage, you know, and uh, but if you look at, you know, for example, if you look at uh, the UN uh, uh, Security Council, you know, uh, the top five, uh, the permanent members, so that would be uh, the US, UK, France, Russia, and uh, China. So, uh, well, India is not in that uh, the elite uh, group. You know, so that's one uh, drawback. And uh, people are trying to change that, but I don't know, I mean, if it's going to happen in uh, the near future. And in terms of uh, GDP, well, India is now the uh, fifth largest and it's going uh, to surpass by at the end of uh, the decade, it's going to surpass uh, Germany and uh, Japan. Uh, then it will be uh, the third largest in the world. So there is uh, uh, that uh, that's going to give uh, India uh, some leverage. Uh, but if you look at uh, GDP per capita, it's still very low. It's still a uh, the low middle income country, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's only like uh, three thousand dollars per year. Uh, the GDP uh, per capita. So it's still a very uh, poor country. And it doesn't uh, match uh, 
of, of China in terms of uh, manufacturing, you know? So when you go around the world, uh, so you're not going to find uh, so people saying, oh, I'm using a, uh, a smartphone that's uh, uh, made by like an Indian company or, you know? So uh, uh, well, India doesn't have uh, the cloud in terms of uh, the technology brands, you know? Mm. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, smart Indians in uh, the U.S., you know, so they are uh, the CEOs of uh, Microsoft, uh, CEOs of uh, uh, Google and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's too bad uh, that those guys are not uh, living in India and uh, uh, we're developing uh, big companies, you know, so it's sort of. Uh, stuck in between, so like maybe uh, about 10, 15 years from now, it'll have uh, a, a more uh, uh, geopolitical influence. And um, I think you cited something where it was an article you published through Medium. It was called um, What Should Be India's China Strategy? And I think you stated that out of the global 500 top companies, there's only seven from India compared to 183 or something in China? I think- uh, 140. 143? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you are, you are basically showing where China has so much influence in the East. Um, I'm curious about what is India's relationship with China and Pakistan, just so my audience can have some context with neighboring countries, um, just to kind sure. of understand what's going on in India as far as politics is concerned. Okay, so uh, well, India was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, were colonized by the British for like uh, 100 plus years. And then when they left, they left this like uh, the ticking bomb, okay? So which is what uh, the British were so good at uh, doing, right? Uh, wherever the, uh, the British went, you know, uh, uh, like in uh, the Middle East or like in Africa, or like in India, uh, they would uh, they would always uh, draw the borders in a way uh, that's going to make sure that uh, the region will be uh, fighting for a long time. You know, so you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, you know, like say like the Middle East, uh, they would choose these uh, different uh, tribes. You know, Sunnis and. Uh, uh, Shiites and Alawites and blah, blah, blah. And they would uh, draw uh, the boundaries so that you don't have 100% uh, uh, Sunnis or 100% uh, uh, Shiites, you know? So they would, uh, like, I mean, uh, like mix them up uh, uh, so deliberately. So these regions will be uh, uh, fighting forever. And then uh, the European and uh, the Americans can uh, very easily uh, manipulate them and to rule over them. Mm -hmm. So similarly, the British, they, uh, you know, fueled uh, the Hindu-Muslim uh, conflict. So uh, they drew the line and uh, they uh, uh, created uh, a new country called uh, Pakistan. And then, so uh, uh, since the late uh, 1940s, uh, well, India and uh, uh, Pakistan have been at uh, uh, the loggerheads with each other, and they have this uh, the region of uh, Kashmir that the British uh, deliberately they uh, left it you know vague. So you know after seventy five years, India and Pakistan are like, oh, we don't agree with uh, who uh, the Kashmir region belongs to. So it's like a terrible mess. Mm -hmm. And similarly, uh, with India and uh, with China, uh, the British drew vague uh, boundaries in uh, the mountains. And these stupid boundaries have been causing troubles, you know, between uh, the two countries. So they went to war against each other in uh, the 1960s. And uh, the U.S. It, uh, they meddled in uh, uh, with Tibet, you know. So uh, uh, the CAA, 
would bring uh, the Tibetan uh, like rebels uh, to uh, the U.S. to like uh, Colorado, and they would, uh, would, uh, would train them, you know, uh, because it was all to fight uh, the communists in China. So then uh, the U.S. came uh, to India and they brought us into uh, the American shenanigans against uh, with China. So then uh, China became uh, mad at India and then they've been fighting uh, the border since then. And uh, things really uh, calmed down in uh, at the 1990s, you know? And then uh, uh, the U.S. said, well, listen, we don't like uh, the trajectory that uh, uh, China is uh, going on. So we have to do uh, the divide and uh, conquer, you know? So for the last uh, 15 years, uh, uh, the U.S. has been wooing India, you know, hey guys, listen, maybe we, you know, you deserve to be the champion like in Asia. Why should China be number one? You can be number one. Okay, which is like a dream because we, we just, we just cannot be like China, okay? <laughs> they're like so far ahead and they're so disciplined and they're so well organized, you know? And in India, you have the crazy uh, democracy, okay? So, th so there's no planning and, you know, like uh, people fight with one another. The uh, state governments don't listen to the uh, central government, you know, so, you know, so you have uh, politicians who get uh, votes by, uh, by, uh, by appealing to the base, uh, the, uh, 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 the human instincts, you know, like, oh, we hate uh, the Muslims, and then you get uh, uh, so many votes, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like so much, you know? That's a lot like the United States. <laughs> a lot of the, a lot of the, you're voting against something instead of voting for something. Right, right, right. I mean, <laughs> because I don't see, you know, for example, like if you look at uh, 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 China's uh, five-year plan, you know, so they just uh, released one a few months ago. And they give you specific, like, d so many details that would put you to sleep. You know, they would be like, we're going to raise the GDP by this amount. We're going to reduce poverty by this amount. We're going to build uh, so many miles of uh, the bullet trains. We're going to build uh, so many... Uh, I mean, at uh, the airports, and we are going to become number one in uh, this technology, this technology, this technology. We're going to build uh, with so many schools, uh, colleges. I mean, like so detailed, right? Mm -hmm. But like in, uh, the U.S. and like in India, nobody makes plans like that. You know, the politicians, they never give you uh, 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 specific details. You know, like uh, Biden never uh, 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 ran on a uh, platform saying, uh, well, if you elect Biden, I will raise the GDP by 4% every year. No, he doesn't say that, you know. So there are no plans. And you have uh, train wrecks in the U.S., you know, uh, bad infrastructure, poverty, homelessness, a drug addiction, racism, uh, so many bad things, and then they just uh, blame one another, you know. So, so same in India, you know. Uh, we will never be as uh, successful as uh, but China, uh, just because. Uh, but nobody plans, you know. <laughs> if you don't plan, you're not going to succeed. Um, but, uh, but there are some good things happening, you know. Uh, uh, this. I mean, uh, the current, uh, the prime minister, he certainly uh, 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 gets votes by uh, fueling uh, the Hindu-Muslim, uh, the antagonism, you know, so, uh, so I'm not happy with that. Um, but on uh, the positive side, he's focusing on uh, the infrastructure, uh, which India needs very, very bad. 
uh, badly, you know. And it's true uh, for all of uh, 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 the developing nations in the world, you know, whether like it's in Asia or like in Africa uh, or in uh, 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 the U.S. now too, right? Uh, so uh, the focus has to be uh, a good infrastructure, you know, uh, because it increases productivity of uh, people, it, it uh, uh, reduces uh, stress, it uh, 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 creates jobs, you know? So uh, the US should be spending billions and billions of dollars on uh, the infrastructure, you know, rather than on uh, bailing out banks and uh, starting wars, you know? I mean, uh, uh, like for example, uh, uh, so do you guys have five uh, G now in your town? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, it's not it's not good service though because we're kind of in a an isolated developing area. So when you go to the urban centers, you you have more better connection. There's still a big mm. divide because. This country is such a big country, so there's lots of rural areas. And that's just like my father-in-law really didn't start getting good internet to 10 years ago. But 14 years ago, I mean, you could hardly even get on the internet in his house because the towers, they didn't have them in his area. But oh, where my I'm God. From, they have all, I'm in a big populated area, so there's more access to that. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, and... So, you know, uh, that's one of the problems in uh, the U.S. is like, it's like, I mean, uh, uh, the capitalism, right? Uh, where people are always uh, thinking about profits, you know? So if you just uh, would look at uh, the profits, you know, they would say, uh, so Kiko's uh, father-in-law, he lives in this small area and it's just not worth it. You know, it, you know, so it doesn't make uh, business sense uh, to, to give that person uh, 4G, 5G, uh, uh, with good roads. It just doesn't make a business sense, you know. And so if you look at uh, China, uh, but they don't do uh, the business sense, you know. So they're about uh, the communism, socialism, where it's all about, you know, uh, uh, serving uh, the people. So you go to like a remote village in uh, China, they'll have a 5G, the farmer will be uh, live streaming, he'll have uh, drones to uh, deliver his uh, fruits, you know, it's like, wow. Yeah, so there's um, there, something. Yeah, there's so many misconceptions about China and um, we would definitely get to China and, and its influence um, for sure, but I was I was kind of wanting to know about India, and I think you gave a good context of kind of where India stands. You made a comment earlier about um, you seem to suggest that India is on an upward trajectory. Is that because of the BRICS um, coalition? Is that the reason why you see India um, increasing its GDP and everything else? Why um, such a positive outlook towards India? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I think one is that uh, uh, the people uh, they want uh, to develop, and uh, a lot of Indians have uh, gone abroad. You know, so like for example, uh, a lot of Indians they uh, live in uh, the U.S. They have uh, good jobs, so we're able to learn from them, saying, "Oh, wow," you know. So that's uh, the possibility, you know, so uh, uh, we can do that. And then the, uh, uh, the second uh, the advantage is, uh, is <laughs> because of uh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. wants, uh, you know, a sort of like uh, a country to be, uh, 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 to balance out uh, with China. So the U.S. has been, super nice to us over the last uh, 15 years, uh, just because of uh, China, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, because if we were like uh, far away from uh, China, the US would be like, 
man, we have better things to do than to worry about this poor country called India. So you're saying that they're using India as a buffer state almost? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I got you. So, uh, so there are like a lot of uh, the U.S. Uh, I mean, uh, the investors they have uh, come to India over the last uh, fifteen years. They're like, yeah, so we will set up uh, the e-commerce for you. We'll set up uh, 5G for you. Uh, we will help you uh, we'll develop India, you know. Uh, so it's sort of like a win-win uh, because uh, the American corporations, uh, they're making a lot of money in India uh, uh, with Amazon, Google, Facebook, Walmart. All of uh, the American companies are making money in India, but they're also... Uh, uh, helping us grow. So they're like uh, uh, funding uh, startups. And uh, so uh, the U.S. is uh, 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 helping us grow, uh, but not out of like uh, big heartedness, but just because of China. <laughs> <laughs> Strategy, huh? <laughs> it's yeah, it's just been like a strategic friendship. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. But, yeah, you know, so I tell my fellow men, you know, they don't really uh, listen to me. Uh, but I tell them, well, listen, you know, it's uh, good to be friends with uh, uh, the U.S. But just know that, you know, like, uh, this is not a uh, charity work, okay? At some point, uh, the U.S. will say, hey, India, uh, we want you to go to a war against uh, China. You know, they have to be very careful with the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame you. Um, hell, we're, we're from the country and we're skeptical about our government. So we know exactly um, a lot of people. And I tell you, just going to some of this resistance, I've never sensed so much anti-war sentiment in this country. But they they have it to where you think that there's um, lots of support for these wars. But honestly, if you analyze and go talk to people, people are getting exhausted of these wars and the, the proxy wars, all the, the kinetic wars, all of them, because they see that money leaving our country and going to other places, and they see it as a lost cause. Like I've sit, talked to all types of people across the political spectrum, and people are really starting to get upset with just this war, this constant warmongering. And people are starting to figure it out. I think that ball is starting to drop. And that's why the U.S. looks more desperate than ever because the, their own citizens is not, they're not taking it anymore when it comes to this propaganda. Yeah. I mean, what is the freaking point? You know, uh, the U.S. has a lot of uh, wealth, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, soft power and you have uh, the creativity and uh, the innovation and you're able uh, to attract uh, smart, hardworking people from all over the world. And you should have a beautiful country, you know? Like, you should have amazing cities, beautiful roads, beautiful subways, safe cities, and there are no homeless people, there are no drug addicts, there's uh, very little uh, crime, you know, uh, beautiful uh, schools, you know, where uh, the kids don't need to go through uh, metal detectors, you know, and you should not have uh, racism in uh, 2023, you know, and, you know, so you should be like a uh, role model for uh, the rest of the world. But instead, oh, my God, it's like so dysfunctional. Right. And for no reason, it's like uh, there's no need to be so dysfunctional. Right. I mean, like if you go to like, so, for example, like, you know, I uh, complain about a lot of things in India, you know, how there is like uh, the power outage, uh, the water is so scary to drink. If you drink the water here, you're going to die. You know, there's there are like so many problems, you know, but at least we're like, OK, so we are a poor country. OK, so like this is the best we can do and it's going to be a slow progress. But uh, what is uh, the excuse for the U.S., mm -hmm. you know? Yes, absolutely. And um, I think we're going to definitely delve into um, this relationship 
with the U.S. and it's, um, I think, potential, not potential, but very likely collapse because, um, and it's only inevitable. And it comes to a word that you brought up. And I'm not even going to lie, SL, I haven't heard this word mentioned as much as I have the last three weeks, this word called um, multipolar, multipolarity. I have not heard of this word explained in such a way like this before, but um, I'll give you sort of like my um, perceptions about it before you actually define what it is. I've thought about the West and the East dichotomy automatically when I think of multipolar, because a lot of people are caught up in the binaries and they think that the West is one thing and the East is one thing. But I think all of it is an illusion because if you ask me, what do you define Africa? Is it the West or the East? That's the problem with categories. Latin America may be located geographically in the Western hemisphere, but as far as the mindset in Latin America, I don't think it's, I don't think it's the West like the United States because, um, and I think that goes into the coalitions between the poor countries and the periphery countries. Because when I think of Latin America, I think of the United States extracting all the natural resources from that region, like they do in Africa and, and the global South. And so to me, Latin America is, is definitely part of the global South. And the global South is, it, is one thing, and then the West is a completely different thing. And I think that's where the multipolar world was going to be inevitable. Because when you have the G7 in the United States, well, the rest of the world is almost stranded. So it would only be natural for those two, those forces to come together against that hegemony. Would you agree with that? And could you kind of detail what does that actually mean, multipolarity? Okay. So, you know, so let's start with like, you know, during uh, the Cold War, you know, uh, the U.S. versus the uh, uh, Soviet Union. So the world was... Uh, bipolar, right? So you either you uh, belong to uh, the American camp or you belong to uh, the Soviet camp. So that was uh, the bipolar world. And then the uh, Soviet Union uh, collapsed. And then, you know, starting in uh, about 1991, it became, I mean, uh, the uh, unipolar world. So it was just uh, the U.S. Uh, the U.S. was uh, the king of the world. You know, there was only one military. There was only one currency, the, uh, the dollar. And there was only uh, one internet, one Google. And if you messed around with the U.S., it's going to bomb the hell out of you. And, you know, so it was just like one country ruled the world for a while. But that fell apart in like uh, about 2008, you know? So uh, the unipolar world, it lasted for about, uh, about 25 years and then it uh, uh, started to shake. But then uh, the US uh, uh, still could not understand the rise of uh, uh, China. You know, they were still stuck in uh, the old uh, the mentality that uh, the Chinese were just making uh, shoes and uh, t-shirts, you know? Mm -hmm. But by the end of uh, 2014, uh, China, they actually surpassed the U.S. in uh, 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 what is known as like uh, the PPP GDP, which is uh, the purchasing power parity, you know? So because if you have... Uh, uh, one dollar in uh, the U.S. is going to buy a lot more in uh, China uh, than in the U.S. So that was the wake-up call, you know. And uh, that's when you know like you had the rise of uh, Donald Trump, and he talked about uh, China, 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 you know, for uh, five years. But uh, the U.S. was not able to stop the rise of China. So, and. Um, so like, there are some things that like a lot of Americans don't understand as to uh, what makes uh, the U.S. so uh, powerful. So the first is uh, the dollar, you know. So uh, since uh, the 1940s, uh, the, uh, uh, the dollar has been uh, the king of the world. 
And uh, that gives Americans extraordinary power, right? So the first is uh, the ability to uh, print and borrow like there's no tomorrow, right? So uh, you can run a fiscal deficit every year. You can run a, a trade deficit, right? And you just have uh, to print dollars, right? And all the rest of the world has to work their asses off, right? The, uh, uh, the Chinese have to work in the factories. They have to assemble the smartphones. Uh, they have to do the hard work. Uh, I mean, uh, the Africans have to work so hard to make uh, the coffee beans. Uh, the Indians have to write uh, the programs. And all that uh, the Americans have to do is print, print, print money. Right. <laughs> so the so the world has been a sort of a, a struggling uh, to escape from this uh, the unipolarity. I mean, uh, uh, the American uh, the hegemony, uh, because uh, the U.S. did not uh, use its uh, uh, power in uh, very good ways. Right. It uh, went and uh, uh, bombed Iraq with just, uh, you know, lies about uh, the WMD. You know, it went and uh, bombed Afghanistan for 20 years. You know, I mean, uh, like there are people who like barely make uh, $1 a day, you know, like in Afghanistan, and you drop like a uh, $1 million bomb on them. You know, I mean, it just makes absolutely no sense. And uh, what uh, the US did in uh, the Middle East, just uh, causing uh, the chaos all over the world. I'm sorry, guys. You know, no, no doubt. Libya, Yemen, Somalia. I mean, you can just list the countries. I mean, yeah, I mean, Libya is basically I mean, a disaster since the Benghazi. I mean, just yeah, all 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 right. United States back. Yeah, so that's all now going to end. Okay, so because you know that is uh, the multipolar world. Uh, where there are going to be uh, with choices uh, for everything. So uh, you are not uh, stuck with uh, the U.S. dollar, you know. Uh, so you can use uh, the yuan, you can use uh, the local currencies. And uh, so BRICS, the, uh, uh, the five countries, uh, they're now uh, trying to add uh, uh, a lot of uh, new members. And uh, they're going to develop uh, 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 their own currency. So uh, the first one is, I mean, uh, I mean uh, the de-dollarization. So there are like uh, 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 three major parts to uh, the multipolar world. So the first is uh, the currency. So uh, you're not going to have uh, the, uh, the dollar hegemony, and uh, but every country will have multiple choices to trade in. Right. So uh, because if you uh, 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 would depend on uh, the dollar, then you become basically a uh, puppet of the U.S., you know, uh, because uh, the U.S. can uh, like threaten you with uh, sanctions like uh, with Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea, you know, and they're all being uh, tortured by the U.S., you know, uh, because they don't, you know, bow. And uh, like, look uh, what happened to Russia. So, uh, so Russia had uh, 400, 500 billion dollars in uh, the foreign exchange reserves. And uh, when the war started, uh, uh, the US, uh, uh, they used it as an excuse and uh, the US government, they basically stole that 400 billion dollars of uh, the Russian money. So the world saw this, they're like, man, uh, this is just way too much. You know, so we need a more uh, democratic system where uh, so countries have to work as, you know, friends and as, I mean, uh, equals. And it's not going to be a boss and, uh, you know, oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, you know. Uh, so, the, uh, uh, so they don't want that uh, bossy relationship. Uh, they don't want uh, uh, the dictatorial relationship. So... Uh, 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 the de-dollarization is uh, 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 number one. And number two is uh, one of uh, uh, the key strengths of uh, the U.S. is to play uh, the divide and rule, right? And uh, they learned that from uh, the European uh, the colonialists, 
Okay. So these uh, British, Dutch, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, they went and uh, conquered the whole world. You know, uh, uh, they went and uh, conquered Africa and Asia. They just uh, robbed people, you know, ruthlessly for like uh, about 200 years. And the way they uh, did that was, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the divide and rule, you know, uh, so make uh, one person fight another, you know, and then at the end, they both are weak and you take over them both. So when uh, the World War II, it uh, finished uh, uh, the European uh, the colonialism, it basically started uh, uh, the Americas, uh, the neo-colonialism, mm -hmm. right? So the U.S. became the friendly face of uh, the modern uh, the colonialism. So they made uh, this African tribe fight that African tribe. Uh, Sunnis fight the Shiites. Uh, uh, the Russians fight uh, the Chinese, blah, blah, blah. So uh, but now there has been like an awakening, you know, so people are like, so I don't know why it took so long, but, you know, suddenly people are like, oh, my God, this is why I am so poor. And this is why I don't have a house, because I am just stupidly fighting with my neighbors. So suddenly uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, you know, uh, so who would have thought? Right, and now Saudi Arabia and Iran are together, uh, uh, but thanks to China. So they went to Beijing. They, you know, signed a, uh, a peace deal, and uh, Syria and uh, but Turkey. Uh, they've been fighting each other for the last fifteen years, and uh, but today uh, they are in uh, 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 Moscow, uh, but talking uh, uh, peace. So. Uh, 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 the peace is going to be a big thing in uh, the multipolar world, and all countries are going to be friends and allies, you know, so uh, uh, but there won't be a boss anymore, you know. Something you said there, just that that's the, the most disappointing thing about these, um, the propaganda, um, and it happens all over the world, the propaganda, every country has propaganda. But I believe that this country has just another level of propaganda. When you talk about um, our interconnectedness with the rest of the world, the, all that stuff you mentioned there, Turkey and Syria in Moscow, um, Saudi Arabia and Iran, how is this not making major headlines? Because that would go against the narrative that the world is so fragmented. The world's not fragmented at all. Um, the world has one common enemy and the world has waken up. And, and I honestly believe that this was a, I think that they kind of let the United States execute this thing out with this, this war machine. Like, I think that's the biggest downfall is that it's just this military industrial complex is it grew so much, but we spread ourselves out too thin. I mean, because you talk about, I mean, the military bases, we have over 800 worldwide. And people are always talking about imperialism. Oh, Russia's this, Russia's that, China's this, China's that. I don't see Chinese military bases in my backyard. But you see U.S. military bases everywhere. Cuba, a country that we're sanctioning, we have a military base there. I mean, it, it, and we just, we drop missiles and test them in Vieques, Puerto Rico, and all the, I mean, Puerto Rico is basically a colony of the United States. And, and Puerto Rico is never going to be able to break away from the United States. Because, I mean, the United States has set it up like that. This whole um, Spanish-American war type of um, domineering, um, even the Monroe Doctrine, Doctrine mentality um, back in the 1800s, just feeling that they own Latin America. Like, if, you, if Latin America does not adjust our political system, we would just meddle with and destroy that political system and put the dictators that we want in power that has to do with our interests. I mean, that's that was the old way like you were describing, but this new world sounds like people are finally waking up and saying no more. And I heard South African prime minister yesterday talk about um, how the International Criminal Court isn't following the rules at all. I mean, it only enforces the rules to certain countries. It doesn't 
enforce the rules towards Israel, who's bombing the Palestine consulate, and the United States, who's committed several war crimes just consistently. So we want to talk about Russia committing war crimes when the United States has been committing war crimes all this time. And so I think that's why you're talking about this collaboration of multiple countries coming together and just restoring this old order into something that's, I guess, new. Yeah, uh, because if you uh, uh, go back to the world's history before uh, the European uh, uh, colonialism, we had a uh, multipolar world, you know? So maybe uh, uh, the countries, you know, uh, uh, one king might be uh, fighting with uh, another king uh, nearby, uh, but overall, uh, we had a very multipolar world, you know? And uh, everybody, you know, so you had uh, the Native Americans in uh, the U.S., and it was a very uh, diverse uh, culture, and there was no one uh, Native American tribe that ruled everyone. You know, so maybe they, you know, fought with one another. But overall, you had a lot of uh, uh, diverse different groups. Uh, same like in Africa, you had a very very uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, tribes, and you had the French and the British and the Germanic tribes. Blah blah in. Uh, of Europe and uh, of China, India, Japan. So uh, we had a very uh, multipolar world. And it's uh, like only uh, the European uh, the colonialism. And they started to dream of uh, 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 world domination, uh, you know, uh, because they had uh, better guns and all that stuff. So, uh, you know, but that's going uh, to come to an end. So, uh, but now, uh, you know, uh, we are going to have uh, different, uh, I mean, uh, the currencies and in uh, but technology, uh, but China has, uh, is uh, 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 pretty much the same level at uh, the U.S., you know, uh, uh, whatever uh, the U.S. can make, uh, but China can make, you know, maybe except for in like, uh, the semiconductors at the very, very high end level, you know. So there are only like maybe four or five technologies, uh, uh, small areas uh, where uh, uh, China is uh, behind, but uh, the whole world is going uh, to catch up, you know. So like, uh, but twenty years from now, uh, the Africans and Indians and everybody will be able to make smartphones and uh, the air conditioners and uh, computers, blah blah blah. So uh, uh, there's not going to be one person with so much uh, control over the money, technology, uh, the military. I mean, uh, but look at like, I mean, uh, the hypersonic uh, missiles. Uh, uh, the U.S. program just uh, failed a few days ago. So they have to restart now uh, the hypersonic missiles, and it's going to take them another uh, but 10 years. But uh, Russia and uh, uh, but China... Uh, they have uh, that program now, okay? So if uh, uh, China and uh, uh, Russia want, uh, 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 but they can destroy Washington, D.C. in like uh, 40 minutes. So, so this is uh, the multipolar world, you know? And soon, you know, so for example, like, I mean, I uh, so look at us, right? I uh, so look, I mean, as we are just uh, the average people, and uh, we are able to speak the truth and to uh, pop the bubble of the entire multi-billion dollar, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the media, I mean, uh, industry, right? I mean, as a Kiko and SL, as a two guys, you know, with no big power, with, you know, we're not uh, multi-millionaires. And... Uh, we can, uh, I mean, uh, but neutralize uh, the propaganda of uh, the, uh, the New York Times, Fox News, MSNBC, right? Mm -hmm. Just two guys. You know, so like, this is uh, the power of uh, the democratization of uh, the information. And, you know, like, this is uh, the multipolar world, right? So uh, one guy in the U.S., one guy in India. And we were like uh, spreading the truth. You know, how awesome is that?
I love it. Um, before I get into the nitty gritty with the currencies and stuff and the BRICS Development Bank, and um, interestingly enough, Dilma Rousseff, um, the ex-president of Brazil, the ousted former president of Brazil, um, is now the president of that BRICS Development Bank. Um, but we'll talk about that soon. But can you sort of recap um, just in a bullet point, what were the three bullet points that you said that, more, that made up the multipolar world? You said de-dollarization, and what were the other two? Okay, uh, uh, so de-dollarization, and then uh, the military, I mean, uh, the neutrality. So uh, there's no one country that has the most powerful uh, the military. And then uh, the number three is uh, the peace movement. Because uh, uh, the weakness of the world uh, becomes mostly from fighting amongst ourselves. Right? So when uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, he wanted to sell oil for, I mean, uh, the euros, uh, the U.S. was able uh, to attack him. Okay, because he did, uh, so he did that as a uh, one person. Same with uh, Bolivia. I mean, as uh, so Gaddafi had this beautiful plan of uh, creating a, uh, of a currency for uh, uh, the Africans uh, backed by gold. Mm -hmm. So they went and uh, killed him and they stole all his gold. But now what is happening is, uh, uh, 15, 20, 30, 40 countries, they're all de-dollarizing at the same time. Mm. Okay, so now the U.S. cannot bomb uh, 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 China, Malaysia, Nigeria, Brazil. <laughs> <laughs> they can't bomb the whole world at the same time. Interesting. Okay, so I have a curious question. So what is the exchange with the rupee? Is that the currency of India, rupee? Okay, yes. so what's the equivalence of rupee to a U.S. dollar, to one U.S. dollar? It's about uh, 75, 80 rupees uh, per dollar. Okay, and this is the curious part about de-dollarization that, that I'm still struggling with, and maybe you can help me and my audience kind of navigate this experience. Um, you said yourself, even in your substack, how the yuan will become the global trade currency. Um, the U.S. dollar is still the reserve currency. And you mentioned that um, in that substack. And I think you said that that dropped from 71% global share to 60% global share um, as the reserve currency, the U.S. dollar. Um, we still, even in our language still, we say dollar, 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 dollar. When do you think that that's going to change um, to where we're not defaulting to using the U.S. dollar when we um, equate that to money? And um, what does that mean as far as the reserve currency status of the United States dollar? Okay. So, um, you know, so, uh, I mean, uh, so why do uh, people need uh, the reserve currency? Because uh, the countries are not allowed to uh, trade with one another in their local uh, currencies. So, uh, well, if India wants to buy uh, uh, some oil from uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, the Saudis will say, well, you have to pay me in uh, the U.S. dollar. And if uh, well, India wants to buy a, a smartphone from uh, China, uh, China will say, well... I'm sorry, but you have to use uh, the U.S. dollar to pay me. So uh, this became a very uh, self-reinforcing mechanism that made uh, the U.S. dollar uh, the king. And to be able to buy that, you know, so people had to say. So then uh, uh, well, India has to go uh, uh, to the U.S. and they have to sell something some uh, goods or services, and then they'll get some dollars. And uh, because, you know, like there is uh, uh, the demand, uh, 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 the value of the dollar is so high, and uh, the U.S. can ask uh, whatever in uh, return, you know? So if, uh, if 
uh, the African countries, they want uh, some US dollar, then uh, the, uh, the US will say, I want 1 million African children to uh, uh, work in uh, the cocoa farms, or I want uh, uh, the people in uh, Latin America to work on uh, the coffee farms and uh, banana farms, okay? And you have to work at a very, very low rate because or else we won't give you the dollar, right? So now that concept is uh, going away as uh, the technology, well, thanks to uh, with technology and uh, geopolitics and uh, smartness, uh, people are starting to uh, trade with one another in uh, the local uh, the currencies. You know, so it's just starting. I mean, I mean, it's starting this year, really. You know, uh, but China has been doing it uh, 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 quietly for the last uh, four or five years. So, uh, but now, about uh, uh, fifteen percent of, uh, of China's trade is actually happening in uh, their currency. I mean, uh, the yuan. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but now, and uh, a few days ago. For the first time in uh, uh, the history, uh, the Chinese bought uh, uh, the natural gas from uh, the Middle East uh, using their currency. Uh, wow. The yeah. That's so this crazy. should have. Yeah. So like uh, this should have been the front page news in uh, Wall Street Journal. You they know, came, because they came, they came prop up the enemy, though. <laughs> You know, uh, but you have to know what is happening, right? I mean, because that's how you make uh, the, uh, the decisions for the future. You know, whether it's uh, good news or bad news, you have to know what is going to happen. But if, uh, but if, uh, but if, uh, I mean, uh, the American businesses, they don't understand uh, the changing world, uh, the de-dollarization, uh, then they're going to be in for a rude shock because the uh, value of the dollar is going to go down because there's going to be less uh, demand for uh, the U.S. dollar, okay? Because if uh, well, uh, well, everybody is just uh, uh, like mostly trading in their own currency and they use the dollar as just like a, in a backup, you know? Say, for example, if uh, Saudi and uh, the Chinese, they say, okay, you know, so our trade will be about uh, 75, 80 percent in our currency or in, I mean, uh, the yuan. And uh, we will just use uh, the, uh, the dollar or uh, uh, the euro for the last uh, about 10, 20 percent. So that's a drop in uh, demand of 90 percent. Okay, so what does that mean? Uh, the U.S. government uh, will not be able uh, to, uh, to print money, to borrow trillions of dollars. And as the value of the dollar goes down, what you're going to buy from uh, Latin America, from uh, China, you know, like uh, uh, the price of your bananas and uh, the T-shirts. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, all of uh, the cost of uh, the import is going to go up. Mm. So now one solution, uh, uh, you know, would be uh, for America to go back to manufacture like the real manufacturing. OK, so not the uh, flipping burgers manufacturing. Uh, so not, you know, making uh, the burrito manufacturing but actually manufacturing, you know, furniture, lamps and uh, of cars and air conditioners, you know? So, but in order to do that, you know, so you have to plan in advance, you know? So you cannot just start the manufacturing of uh, the air conditioners in uh, Tennessee, you know, just like that, you know? So you have to plan uh, the ecosystem. Where am I gonna get the coal, the steel, the parts? You have to build the factories. You have to train the people. You have to build the seaports and you need uh, but trains that don't uh, derail, you know? Mm. Uh, so uh, like if I, you know, so, uh, you know, uh, the politicians in uh, the US and uh, the business leaders, 
should be uh, planning for uh, the post dollar world. Okay, so to me, that almost creates a situation where if people are using their own currencies to trade, then what 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 does it even matter at that point having a reserve currency? Like that's just a thought at that point, right? But I mean, really, if you think about it, fiat currency, it's just it's the idea anyway. It's not backed by anything. I mean, what is the U.S. dollar backed by? Just a bunch of utopian ideas that is the best currency because. I mean, we've got off the gold standard, I think, on the Nixon. So it really doesn't have value. The value is only what we apply to it at that point. Yeah. So, you know, uh, the BRICS people, and it's going to be a huge announcement like in August, you know. Uh, so uh, the BRICS leaders are going uh, to South Africa like in August, and uh, they might have a whole bunch of uh, 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 brand new members like... Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran, uh, but Nigeria, uh, uh, but Argentina, and these countries are going to say, uh, uh, so uh, uh, we have a, uh, uh, a BRICS currency uh, that's not just uh, the fiat currency, but it's actually backed by gold, uh, uh, the oil, natural gas, and maybe even lithium. Mm -hmm. Okay, so imagine that a, 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 a global currency for maybe 60% uh, of the world's population and about 50% uh, of the world's uh, GDP, and they have a solid uh, currency that's backed by gold and uh, commodities. So why would somebody want to use uh, the dollar? Interesting. Um, okay, so I'm trying to figure this out. Are those, is that alliance, is that tied to the New York Stock Exchange whatsoever? Because I know that they trade commodities on the New York Stock Exchange um, all the time. So with those bricks, would that be, um, would that be a relationship with that? Or would that be completely separate? Yeah, I think in the, the beginning, it's going to be uh, just for, uh, 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 trading uh, like within uh, the BRICS members, you know, and then uh, then who knows? Maybe uh, over ten years from now, if it's really uh, 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 successful, then uh, more members will join, and uh, 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 but there might be some plan. But for now, it's just uh, for trading, you know. So, mm -hmm. so you won't see like a BRICS, uh, but printed currency, mm -hmm. but it'll just. Uh, the digital version for uh, trading, you know, between uh, China, India, Russia, blah, blah. Okay, so it, let's just say that this um, currency that's backed by um, gold and silver or whatever other commodities, oil, gas, the, basically almost like a, a petrodollar consolidation of BRICS members. Okay, let's just say that that goes well for like five to ten years, and that it, it becomes a success story and it really builds even more momentum because the thought sounds very encouraging and um and it's a novelty it's something that's never been done before really this collaboration of um a lot of these global south countries coming together with russia and china um what where does that lead the dollar like to me that wouldn't be a point of having the dollar i guess at that point because the dollar isn't bad for anything at all yeah. So, uh, uh, I mean, uh, the U.S. has a lot of, uh, you know, strength. You know, for example, if you look at, say, uh, I mean, uh, 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 the Great Britain, right? So uh, the empire uh, fell apart in uh, 1945, but uh, the British pound, it still has a lot of value. You know, so uh, the, so uh, the U.S. dollar uh, will still be uh, uh, like one of uh, the big currencies for a long time. You know, uh, so it's not going to like uh, fully uh, collapse, but uh, but it's really up to uh, the U.S. leaders to 
uh, to rethink, uh, to reimagine, uh, to come up with, uh, with new strategies for uh, the post-American century. You know, I mean, it needs some, uh, uh, the humility, it needs uh, completely uh, uh, different ways to think about foreign policy. It needs uh, a different way to do, uh, to think about uh, the economy. And it needs a, 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 a different way to think about uh, politics, you know? You really need somebody who's going to bring all Americans together and not be stuck in stupid Democrats versus Republicans, black versus white, uh, straight versus LGBTQ, whatever, you know, just mad, you know. So we're just we're just a one country, one family, and let's you know focus on you know fixing the problems, uh, but making people rich and happy, you know that should be the focus. But. I think that's where the misconceptions are because um, what all this stuff that's happening with the, and I've said this on the forum from the very first episode with Mark Dean, Kyrie D and Wilson, the, the two major issues that are, I don't want to call everything a wedge issue because it's a social issue and maybe it polarizes the society some. Um, because all these issues are really important. They, well, what they do is they exploit um, the issue for a political agenda. They don't they don't take the issue itself and try to grow it to help people come together. They do it to divide the people. And um, of course, humanity is important, and and we have different types of identities and races and cultures and stuff. We have to coexist. But I think that is almost more of an experiment of the ruling class to, to mess us up in our minds. I don't think the division is that real the way they're making it. They're trying to sell it to everyone that the division is that deep and that severe. I don't believe it's that severe because I've, I've seen a cultural change just from my lifetime. And I believe people are more open-minded than ever. Um, of course, you're going to have separation. But I mean, that's in any society. But I think the media does that just to constantly distract people. And that's how they keep the generational um, blue team, red team alliance in the family. Because our political system is a joke anyway. I mean, we have one party, really. The blue-red party is the one party. And everyone else is not even allowed to participate in the real democratic process. So if you are someone like myself, who doesn't care about either of the corporate parties, you're ostracized automatically. And so your friends, they basically make you feel like you're a terrible person every time it's a two to four year cycle because Kiko's not participating in the blue and the red team um, show. And so that means Kiko is an outsider. He's an alien. He's an extraterrestrial because he won't participate in this. <laughs> but, but, but they don't represent me. So why should I participate in something that doesn't represent my principles. And so, and that's where people really have to start to break away from the system because the system is not going to break away on its own. The people have to put aside their little cultural differences and they have to prioritize what is more important. And I think that's where we have to start prioritizing things more. That doesn't mean that culture is not important. And that doesn't mean that your neighbor hates you. But um, that is definitely a seed that's planted by the mainstream media, by the government, because they know that as long as we're divided, they can still control us. I mean, that's really the only thing they can do. Um, they have to have that division there. But um, unfortunately, the working class is, um, they're distracted right now. But, but I think there's going, going to become a time where um, the poverty is so immense that those things are going to have to take the front stage and everything else is going to become secondary. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, because there's only uh, one division, okay? And that's the uh, 0.1% uh, versus uh, the 99.9%. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is the that is the only true division. And then the, uh, the rest is all, I mean, uh, we're being bamboozled. I had a, a couple of burning questions before we go. Um, 
I'm still so stuck on this this dollar phenomenon because um, I'm thinking of China and this situation that you talked about with the BRICS coalition and um, just trading in your own currencies, you know, the petro yuan you mentioned in your article. Um, where does that lead the U.S. dollar with China? Because China owns a lot of our bonds, I think. Um, so so what, is China, what if China decides to dump a lot of the U.S. bonds, like, is that, could, could China afford to dump the U.S. bonds? And where would that leave us and where would that leave China? Okay. You know, so there is a, uh, a saying, right? Like, uh, I believe if you own, uh, so if you borrow uh, $1,000 from the bank, uh, that's your problem. But if you borrow $1 million from the bank, that's the bank's problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the U.S. has, uh, you know, uh, borrowed uh, $7 trillion from uh, foreign countries. So it's now their problem. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so they want to get rid of it, but they cannot do it fast. You know, because if uh, China dumps its uh, one trillion dollars of bonds in uh, the market, uh, the value is going to go down, and uh, the only loser—I mean, so uh, one of the losers will be uh, China too. So mm -hmm. uh, slowly get rid of uh, the dollars. You know, so they had about uh, uh, one point four trillion dollars a few years ago of uh, the treasuries and it's now uh, down to 900 and uh, they'll probably, you know, so they will slowly uh, get rid of it over the next uh, 10 years uh, 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 because they don't want to lose uh, the money. So, uh, but on the other hand, uh, uh, this, uh, the 10 years is going to be the most uh, dangerous in uh, the human history. Uh, because it's going to be at the end of uh, the American empire. Uh, but how uh, the U.S. elites are going to, uh, to handle that is like a big question. In uh, the ideal world, uh, they will say, okay, fine, you know, we had a, uh, a good run, uh, 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 but America was uh, the king for about uh, 100 years. And now we'll we'll get uh, 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 demoted. You know, uh, we're not going to be this uh, the CEO of the world, but we'll be like a vice president. You know, the one among the many vice presidents of the world, <laughs> and we're okay with that, right? So, like uh, that's uh, the path number one. That will be the most uh, the peaceful, and that will be the best for the world. Uh, uh, the second path that uh, uh, the U.S. elites can uh, take is there is no freaking way we're going to be number two, okay? We are going to fight you to the death. We will do everything we can. We will sabotage the North Stream. We will start false flag attacks. We will do the uh, nuclear stuff, we will bomb, kill anybody, and we will stop China, we'll stop Russia, and we are, and we are going to be uh, the king of the world for a long, long time. And we are going to be brutal, and we are going to be ruthless about that. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's uh, the second possibility, you know? So, so that's the scary part. I don't know, you know, I'm uh, hoping it will be the first path eventually. Um, and uh, a lot of the science, I think a lot of the world leaders, they understand, you know, uh, 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 because even like in India, who is uh, very, very uh, close to the U.S., they uh, uh, refuse to sanction uh, Russia, you know, and uh, but India is also joining uh, the de-dollarization bandwagon. Right. 
you know, so I don't know, you know, so we just have to pray that uh, there are some, but, you know, uh, what they did uh, to, uh, to Trump, you know, uh, 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 whether you are a, uh, a liberal or a, uh, a conservative, neither one of you. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, so uh, William, for all his faults, you know, you know, there are like a, a lot of things that, uh, you know, uh, one doesn't have to like about uh, 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 Trump. But from the uh, geopolitical uh, point of view, uh, he wanted to uh, to make peace with uh, North Korea. You know, he went and uh, shook hands with uh, King Jong Un, you know. Uh, as no other American uh, 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 president had uh, done that uh, when he was the president. I think uh, Bill Clinton uh, uh, met his dad once. But, you know, and he met with uh, Putin. And he, so, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the U.S. Uh, but deep state, uh, they did that to JFK, you know, because uh, JFK wanted to make uh, peace with Russia. Uh, JFK did not want uh, to prolong uh, the Vietnam War. Uh, he wanted uh, peace. And you go, uh, but listen to JFK's uh, speeches. They were so beautiful. He was so visionary, you know? And he said, uh, what kind of a uh, Pax Americana do we want? And he gave this like beautiful uh, description. So they killed him. They're like, what? You're talking about peace? Boom. You know, so for all his, uh, you know, faults, you know, so Trump, if, uh, but Trump would uh, make peace with Russia, you know, uh, 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 but he would stop uh, the Ukraine war. And uh, that's what uh, uh, the U.S. elites, uh, the deep state, that uh, they don't want. And uh, uh, that's the sole reason that they have arrested Trump now. I was going to ask you about the Trump situation. And um, when you're outside of the political system, you don't have these emotional jerk reactions, um, knee jerk reactions. And um, like I said, I have lots of very like beautiful friends. They're beautiful people, but sometimes they're very naive in the way they think about stuff. Um, and um, it's just they expect black people to think a certain way about people because they have a certain view about it. But I'll be 100 percent honest with you. Most black people that I talk to could care less about any of this stuff with Donald Trump right now. Like I just talked to my siblings right now and we're all laughing about it. Like, honestly, I don't have Trump derangement syndrome like a lot of my friends do. Um, the white yeah. liberals are absolutely obsessed with Donald Trump all the time. It's Trump, 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 Trump. And I try to look at things. My biggest disappointment with Trump, I've said this several times in the forum with Tyler King in episode eight, was that Trump is, is to me, Trump is the deep state. Because Trump, he does take stances like the, the gesturing with um, Putin and with um, the North Korean leader. But at the same time, he still decides to run consciously as a Republican, knowing that the Republican Party is never going to allow him free reign like he would want to. If he's a genuine person, he would never run under the two-party banner. And he knows this because he was associated with the third-party movements in the past. So I think he's, to me, he's playing the role of the right-wing version of Bernie Sanders. Bernie did this stuff to... Um, the true leftists, like myself, I'm, I consider myself a socialist, like a true, not this fake blue Democrat stuff that are basically, they're just all capitalists at the end of the day, tied to the bankers. Trump is basically playing that role on the other side. And then you have the people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, Lauren Boebert, and, um, and Get, um, Getz and all these other, they have these views like, oh, we shouldn't be going to war. We should bring that money back here. They say good stuff. They have this populist undertone, but at the end of the day, they're still Republicans. And so to me, if Trump broke, really broke away from the system and ran as an independent, I would believe that sentiment more. But to me, he's keeping that system intact 
And that's the one thing I think we need to break away is we need some figure that would destroy this red blue binary, this divide and conquer the binary. And I don't know if he's what I don't think he's going to do it because I don't think he wants to risk his life. Um, mm. And so I think what you wrote about the JFK stuff is interesting. I don't know if you were making a comparison with Trump in that regards, but I think that Trump is in a different context than JFK. JFK was in a different context. And Trump is uh, making a decision to run within the Republican Party, um, even though he has opposition within the Republican Party and people that don't like him at all in that party, but he's still doing it. And so I think um, I think he's tricking us internally here, even though I think geopolitically he's definitely a better option than Biden, for sure. Um, Biden is nothing but a warmonger. That's all he is. Um, he's the biggest war hawk ever, probably. Um, not to mention um, the head police of the United States with just the, the, the drug epidemic that we're going through right now. And Biden was all behind that, um, the police state philosophy. But um, it's going to be interesting um, what you said there about Trump and, you know, how this is going to play out in 2024 and the rest of the world and um, world peace and everything else. Um, I think it's kind of to be continued, I think, as like you were saying earlier. Yeah. And yeah, it, it's really, it, and it's tough. Like I said, I, I really, I'm a very big skeptic of the system. Um, I believe they're all working together in this um, intricate network, um, Trump included. Um, it's like watching the movie, honestly, like this stuff with him being arrested is almost like, this is like the next thriller that's coming out. I mean, what's going to happen after the summer? Like I'm just waiting for this summer to surpass 2020 and all the events that happened during that summer and that year with COVID and George Floyd. And it seemed like everything that could possibly go wrong did go wrong in 2020. And it's almost like they did it on purpose. And, and I see 2024 yeah. being a lot of the same way. Yeah, man. Uh, you know, like you said, I mean, it's those, you know, so the, uh, there was a guy named, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Ross Perot in uh, 1992, you know? So it's so surprising that we don't have more people like him, you know? So at least to give a third party some hope of, you know, starting, you know, because or else it's just like uh, uh, the two cheeks of this of uh, the same ass, you know? You, you know, you kiss the... Uh, uh, the left cheek and then the right cheek is not going to change anything. No. Well, see, it's so it's funny that you say that about the, the, the wings are not going to break apart because the wings need each other to form the bird. You know, you have to have two wings of the bird. And the stuff, the Democrats constantly talk about voter suppression. They talk about this stuff all the time about how they're denying black people the right to vote. They're denying um immigrants the right to vote all this shit comes up all the time and it's interesting because the democrats also they don't tell you during the elections that they throw the green parties off of the ballots they throw their signatures away when they get the required number of signatures whether you're the psl the green party the libertarians they would discount those people's signatures saying they didn't meet the requirements and both parties will work together to make sure a third party cannot even get on the ballots and so they tell you one thing, but they're suppressing voters behind closed doors. Like they did this the last election. Um, that's why there was such a low turnout when it came to third party representation, because Jill Stein, they're still blaming her for Trump in 2016 because the Green Party got so many votes in Wisconsin. And so what they did this time was they blocked the Green Party, I think, in Wisconsin. They blocked them. They blocked them in Pennsylvania. They only made 30 states ballot assets this time, the Green Party, because the Democrats were basically holding everything in litigation against the third party candidates. And the libertarian lawyers were actually paying to help the Green Party candidates get on the ballots. But, and so people don't see this stuff. They don't talk about it. So the real war is actually within the political system itself. The blue team and the red team want to stay strong. So they can be the only two characters in this movie. They don't want any other characters. Yeah. I mean, you know, I just go take a look at, uh, 
the uh, the campaign contributions, just which, which is basically bribery. Okay, so they, I mean, it's just pure bribery. You know, if you just you know, and uh, uh, who funds the Democrats? Wall Street. Who funds the Republicans? Wall Street. And you look at uh, Big Pharma. You know, they fund to both. It's like the uh, same owners, okay? And uh, they're just... Uh, 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 can you see me? Uh, but can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so what happened was uh, we lost electricity in India. Okay, so like, this is what I'm uh, talking about. <laughs> yes. No, no, no. I figured that's what so... it was. I can tell. Like, no, no problem. Yeah. So, like, uh, this is the uh, the life in a uh, third world country uh, where you lose electricity, like, freaking uh, so many times a day. It is so horrible. Yes, um, no doubt. Um, it, it's definitely a situation. I hear my friends in Cuba and Haiti, they talk about how just um, randomly there would be power outages throughout the day. Yeah. And it's, you know, so, uh, I mean, uh, so these are the reasons, you know, like this is uh, like one of the reasons uh, that India will uh, would never be able to catch up to China. You know, because uh, people just don't even uh, I will understand uh, why this is bad. You know, like if I talk to people about, uh, you know, why uh, the infrastructure matters, uh, uh, why we shouldn't have a uh, power outage, uh, that doesn't even really uh, sink into people's minds. You know, they go, well, yeah, what's the big deal? <laughs> And how often, SL, do those happen, those outages? Are they just always randomly like that? Do they happen every week? Yeah, they happen like at least uh, uh, three, four times a day. Oh, okay. wow. I mean, really? and I live in, yeah. And I live in uh, the supposedly like uh, the Silicon Valley of India, you know, where right. you have all these IBM, like, you know, Facebook, Google, blah, 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 and they all have uh, big offices here. That's that's incredible, but um, it, it's it's almost um not that I wanted it to happen, but it's also quite revealing um because I think some people need to see that stuff real time to kind of understand it. And um, yeah, no, we don't have um, there's no concept of that really here. Um, I guess I can go back a generation. Or two, I know when I was growing up, it was seven or eight of us. We were all living in the house together. We were sleeping in the same bed. Um, my grandmother, mm. my parents, it was my great uncle, my sister. So I guess I could compare that to something maybe in an earlier time. I think some Americans can. But nowadays, um, even in the so-called um, abject poverty areas, people still have cars. Um, people still have electricity. <laughs> And so, no, it's yeah. a different experience altogether. Um, I know when I lived in Costa Rica, when I was in the shanties, I mm. mean, it was, um, they always sell this image of Costa Rica as like the beaches and everything else. But that's not how Costa Rica is if you go throughout mm. the country. Mm. Yeah, so they just have like these, I mean, uh, the touristy places where uh, things are beautiful. And then when you go outside, it's like uh, we're totally uh, another world. Yes. And so the crazy part is that a lot of the five star hotels that they build and the four stars that they build in these resorts in Costa Rica, they they basically they use those buildings and the infrastructure at the expense of the local communities there because the multinational companies, they come in and even though the local people may not have good water, and electricity, they have it for these facilities that are offshore, basically, these multinational corporations. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, uh, but that's a uh, another big uh, story and a uh, but topic as to how, I mean, 
it's uh, you know how uh, the World Bank and uh, the IMF uh, they keep uh, the poor countries down with uh, plans like that. You know, so uh, they make sure uh, that uh, uh, borrow in uh, the U.S. dollars. You know, so the IMF and uh, the uh, the World Bank would give uh, uh, loans to uh, the developing nations, and uh, these countries would just uh, spend the money on uh, the multinational uh, the corporations building uh, beautiful hotels and lakes and you know blah 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 and uh, the money never goes to uh, the real people and then uh, the government won't be able to uh, uh, pay back the loans in a few years and then uh, the IMF will uh, come and say well you know so you need uh, uh, to privatize your uh, natural resources so uh, uh, we sell the lithium, uh, sell the gold and, you know, and so on. And uh, so this creates like a vicious uh, trap. And uh, uh, this is how uh, the developing nations have uh, stayed poor. I mean, uh, like if you look at uh, the African uh, uh, countries, right? They should be the richest people in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, they have so much gold, so much uh, 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 oil, uh, but natural gas, uh, but timber and iron ore, blah blah blah. I said, how come Africa is so poor? I said, how come uh, uh, five hundred million people in Africa uh, still don't have access uh, to electricity? It is so bogus. Absolutely. And um, and I was thinking about that when you were talking about the BRICS. That's the one thing I feel that could um, mm -hmm. derail the, the whole coalition with BRICS. Is, um, I mean, you take Brazil, for instance, and the World Bank and the IMF are all over the Amazon. I mean, they have all types of interest in the Amazon. When you talk about just um, the medicine, yeah. all the natural resources um, in the Amazon, rainforest in that region and and the world banks are all over that area they've always um condemned the indigenous tribes in those areas and taken away their land and stuff i mean they constantly have presences um in those areas it's, that, it's definitely that um the core periphery um dichotomy and a lot of the times in the global south i mean that's where the abundance of the natural resources are but then you have these global north um, multinational corporations um, trying to control those resources. Yeah, right. You know, so uh, the problem with uh, the most of the world is that uh, they don't really understand uh, the colonialism, right? You know, because uh, the modern uh, but colonialism is very sophisticated. Mm. So, uh, you know, so if you go to a uh, developing nation, you know, like if you go uh, to Costa Rica, you know, uh, to Ecuador and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so most people, they don't understand, you know, uh, but how the U.S. Uh, but keeps them uh, poor. And they don't understand uh, the Monroe Doctrine because, you know, like you have a uh, fake election, you get to vote, you get to fight, and you see uh, with your people in uh, in uh, uh, the power, and they would think, oh, uh, the U.S. is so nice. You know, they allow uh, the immigrants, and, uh, <laughs> you know, but they don't understand that they are poor because of the U.S., you know. Right. I mean, it's not... <laughs> Yeah, if you just, you know, uh, like uh, the new uh, the president of, I mean, uh, El Salvador, right? And they used to have this, um, oh, electricity is bad. I see Mama that. Mia. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's not always, oops, but it's not always uh, but guaranteed. And then it may uh, but go off in like, 
you know, five, 10 minutes. It's so crazy. Mm -hmm. But um, so uh, we all know about that, uh, the three letter, uh, the agency that has a lot of uh, links to uh, drug uh, people all over the world, you mm -hmm. know? And so uh, this, uh, the El Salvador guy, uh, so the, uh, uh, but they used to have like uh, the murder rate of uh, 150 uh, per uh, uh, about 10,000 or something like that, you know, like uh, basically, uh, uh, so he uh, reduced uh, the murder rate from uh, 150 to seven. Mm. So he like uh, uh, reduced it uh, by 95% or something. And, uh, you know, like there was all these like, uh, I mean, uh, the MS-13 gangs and all of that. He got rid of all of them. He put like thousands of these people in uh, prison. And uh, what is uh, the U.S. response? He's violating human rights. <laughs> Man, what world do you guys live in? You know, uh, so so there needs to be this uh, the true uh, freedom of uh, the small people, uh, the small countries, uh, uh, the poor countries, and they all should be able to make their own decisions, to make uh, good decisions, and. Uh, what uh, 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 the rich countries uh, uh, should do is to be a good mentor. You know, hey, uh, uh, so we will help you uh, like establish a good uh, 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 judicial system. We will share with you our uh, best practices for a uh, civil society. And uh, we will come, you know, and... Uh, so if you don't have uh, the resources uh, 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 to drill for uh, the oil, uh, we will come and do it, but we will do it uh, fairly, you know? So you get your uh, due share of the money and you, you, and you use that money to build schools and uh, uh, colleges and you develop uh, the engineers who uh, about 20 years from now will be able uh, uh, to manage these oil, uh, 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 the drigs yourself, you know, so you're not uh, dependent. Mm -hmm. But uh, that sort of uh, but thinking, it needs a uh, different, I mean, uh, but, uh, but it almost needs sort of like a, a spiritual uh, level of thinking, you know, uh, where you're not always uh, thinking of as how can I screw others? How can I uh, but control others? How can I uh, but exploit others? Uh, you know, but rather it's like a win-win situation. Wow, man, I'm so happy to see, you know, like, you know, so if you live in uh, but Tennessee, uh, then you should be uh, like happy to see uh, uh, the Arkansas people uh, being successful. <laughs> And you should be uh, happy to see uh, the Mexicans being successful. And you should be happy to see uh, the Nigerians being successful, you know? But that sort of uh, the mentality, I hope it uh, 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 comes in uh, the multipolar world. And then we get uh, uh, to compete with one another in like a good, uh, 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 I mean, uh, the wholesome spirit, you know? So uh, uh, the Tennessee people are able uh, uh, to compete with uh, the Louisiana people, but on friendly terms. And uh, the Nigerians are able uh, uh, to compete with uh, the Kenyans and uh, the Chinese versus uh, uh, the Indians. And it should be like a good, uh, healthy competition. Absolutely. Yeah, you've stressed that a lot in episodes um, about this idea of cooperation. And that's really what we need. Um, we need cooperation. And it, it, sometimes it's just as simple as that. I think we need um, 
a reset, but not a world economic forum reset. We need a re a, we need a psychological reset um, and sort of reassess um, loving our community more, loving our families more, trying to respect people more. You know, just um, we we can have differences, but you still have to you need to respect people. And um, I think those types of things go a long way because that can translate. You know, that translates across these imaginary boundaries that we know as countries. Um, I have one final question before we go, and um, I had to slip it in before we go, and I definitely want you back on SL. Um, we could probably talk for two or three more hours, but um, I have places to go, and I got 12 or 13 more interviews um, just in the next few weeks, um, which is absolutely mind-boggling to me that the forum has gone from just an episode every two weeks to all of a sudden having three to four a week. Um, I had a question about the largest economy in the United States, which is known as the state of California. Um, we know that there's been so much with the banking collapse, which I think is, a, I don't follow the mainstream media. So what I do is I try to follow people like yourself and just piece everything together. You know, I listen to what my dad says and whatever, you know, everyone tells you the news. You don't even have to watch the poison box. All you have to do is just close your eyes and people will tell you what's happening in the world, you know, because everyone else is watching the fake news. So you don't have to watch it yourself. You can save yourself all that stress and despair and just let other people tell you the information. And then you can decide for yourself, is that good quality or is that just terrible quality information? Um, what happened with the stories with the banks? Um, are they not in dire straits situation anymore because the media went hard into the banking crisis and now it's about Trump and now it's about this and that. And I don't know if you heard, but the Cash App founder was murdered this morning. Oh, wow. No, I mean, I did not know that. The founder of Cash App was stabbed to death. Wow. So there's a lot going on right now. And, um, you know, obviously, I think the details of the murder haven't really been, um, I guess, broadcast a lot. You know, there's a lot of uncertainty about what happened. But um, what can you comment as far as um, the outlook of the banks in the United States and the health of the banks? And why does it seem like it happens all of a sudden these banks are just unhealthy? So the biggest problem was the fact that the uh, uh, the Federal uh, Reserve Bank, they raised the rates from 0% to about uh, 5% very fast in about uh, one and a half years. And uh, what this means is that it just wrecked the bond market, you know? So uh, if you had bought a bond in uh, 2019, that gave, uh, you know, uh, that had a yield of uh, uh, 0.1%, uh, but now the bond yields are uh, 4 or 5%. Uh, uh, that bond you bought in uh, 2019 and uh, 2020, uh, they've lost like uh, about 30, 40% of their value. So the banks are now sitting on about, of $600 billion of uh, uh, losses on the bonds, okay? <laughs> and, the, and the banks are not uh, uh, collapsing uh, uh, only because they're not uh, selling the bonds, you know? Like if they uh, try to sell the bonds, uh, 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 then the banks would go belly up, mm -hmm. you know? So you have... So uh, the bottom line is that uh, the regional banks, uh, they're going to get uh, destroyed. And all the uh, the top guys, uh, JP Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, uh, Citigroup, uh, they're going to buy all the regional banks at the big uh, discount. Mm. And it's going to be, yeah, so like, uh, but this is going to be very bad for uh, uh, the US economy. Uh, because you're going to lose a lot of banks, a lot of jobs, and uh, uh, the power is going to get uh, more and more uh, concentrated. 
and uh, that creates a very dangerous uh, uh, system you know like when you have like uh, 50 big banks uh, then you can say okay uh, so like even if uh, one goes down uh, the rest uh, 49 will uh, uh, manage uh, the economy but if you have only uh, you know four or five banks it's like i mean uh, uh, the oligopoly and they have these I mean, like there are some crazy statistics about, uh, I mean, uh, the derivatives, you know, like uh, JP Morgan has uh, tens of trillions of dollars of uh, derivatives. And they claim, oh, you know, like uh, we are so smart, we can uh, manage it, we hedge everything. But man, if your math is off by just uh, 1%, uh, that's going to, you know, uh, to ruin the whole economy. Mm. So the banking um, is so screwed up. It's just like a giant uh, Ponzi scheme with the uh, F uh, Federal Reserve just uh, printing the money like there's no tomorrow. And uh, this goes back to our uh, uh, de-dollarization uh, 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 conversation. Uh, because if the world uh, does not need a lot of uh, the dollar, uh, uh, this, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the printing orgy is going to come to an end. Yes, and um, th so it seems like it's almost a playbook of 0809. With the um, we saw the regional banks get completely destroyed because um, that's the thing. That's what bothers me so much about. Um, the propaganda when it comes to the political parties. I mean, they call people like Biden a socialist, which is just, it's a complete joke. I mean, it, to me, that is anti-intellectual to say something like that. I mean, to call yeah. Democrats socialists. I mean, they're nothing but capitalists. I mean, just, um, and, and that's a downfall of capitalism. But people who promote capitalism don't want to say that, that that's a downfall of capitalism. They talk about socialism all the time, but they constantly bail out the capitalists. The government does all well, the time. They don't bail us out, but they bail out the banks, and they always try to reward it and call it something else. Well, you have to save Citigroup. Or the whole system is going to destroy. It's going to fall apart. So, but the community banks, they can just all fail, and that's fine. Yeah. So uh, uh, they believe in uh, 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 socialism. But they believe in uh, socialism for the rich. They believe, <laughs> yeah. they believe in socialism for the banks. They believe in socialism for uh, the corporations. You know, but if you as a small business owner, and if you are a, uh, a regular American, and if you are a uh, blue collar worker, uh, there's no socialism for you. And then it's like pure hardcore capitalism hey so you can't pay the rent this month get the hell out of the apartment <laughs> no doubt and um and just follow follow the money opensecrets.org i always urge my listeners um trump was number one recipient of fossil fuel lobby money the last election biden was number two who were the two predominant candidates Come on, people. It's a smoke screen. I mean, let's get on with the program already. Big pharmaceutical companies, the big technological companies, within the top 30 lobbyists of the country, half of them are healthcare industry companies. And the other are tech companies like Meta, which is Facebook, Instagram, and all these other companies tied together. So it's really the same revolving door of companies. And these banks that have been saved now, and the government is pumping money into these banks, they're going to be the same people funding the political campaigns this cycle and the next one and the next one. So people really need to start connect the dots and get their acts together and stop this fighting and stop supporting this oligarchy. That's all you're doing. You're, you're delaying the process. You're bleeding out the American worker and everybody else, and you have us thinking that we're contributing to society with these fake votes when the pharmaceutical companies and the lobbyists are the only ones that are winning, no one else is winning. Um, when COVID happened, the American people lost, the banks won, 
and the government won. I mean, we didn't win anything. I mean, and then and then they pushed down our products constantly. All they talked about were pushing the products down our throats. And people know what I'm talking about when they, when I talk about the products. And if you didn't want it, if you want to reject the product, you were a bad person. And if you took in the products, guess what? Those companies took in the profits, the Pfizer's and everybody else. And so don't start with the um, your neighbor's a terrible person because they didn't want to get a job. It had nothing to do with that, I don't think at all. It was all about making more money and creating more crises on top of what we already have. And and Biden said himself, I think, in a press conference recently, we have to plan for the next pandemic. So these people are already telling you that they're planning this shit out like way in advance. And people think you're a conspiracy theorist when they say, oh, you're making that up, Kiko. No, Fauci said himself four years before this happened that there's going to be a pandemic soon. Like, what do you think he's saying that for? He's not just saying it just to say it. He knows stuff that we don't know. I mean, these people are insiders. They're part of the one, inside the 1%. They're, they're more special than the 1% that we know. They have all the tools, and we're just basically following the orders of those people. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, it's called, uh, uh, what is the face? Um, I mean, uh, the problem, reaction, solution. Okay, so they make the problem and then you freak out, you know, you know, so you get scared and they provide you the solution that they already have uh, made up. And then, uh, but you think they are the savior. Okay, they're not the savior. Okay, so it's like the guy who, you know, I mean, uh, the arson who uh, set the fire, and then he uh, becomes and uh, tries to help you uh, put out the fire, and he has an agenda, and it's so hard because people just. So uh, when you ask, you know, people, hey, uh, so do you believe in uh, the mainstream media? You know, so most people say no, but they all do, obviously, okay? <laughs> because or else we wouldn't have like the mainstream media. If uh, but nobody followed mainstream media, we wouldn't have all this uh, mainstream media. And uh, people will eventually, they repeat uh, the mainstream establishment. You know, they believe, you know, if you're a Democrat, you just cannot even imagine that uh, Biden is lying. OK, and if you are a, uh, a Trump supporter, you cannot even imagine, you know, that he is uh, fooling you. <laughs> you know? I mean, just like with the with the with the vaccines it's crazy. Do people forget that he he could have fired Fauci if he wanted to, but it, that was not ever part of the plan. And if you watch, even if you go back to the COVID episodes. I had all my conservative friends just losing their mind and stuff. And I'm a libertarian. I'm a love libertarian. So I I always thought it was a choice anyway for a person to decide that on their own. And that's what a libertarian is. But I'm just, I happen to be a libertarian that's on the other side of it. And so I believe that people should have health care, education, everything already provided. But I have libertarian views when it comes to stuff like body autonomy. And this is an issue of body autonomy, especially something that is a new situation. And you're telling me I should inject this and, and I have to do it or whatever. And that's where you have to draw the line. I mean, like I said, you can do what you want to do, but don't condemn me for making a decision for myself and my family. And um, and Trump was all for that. It was under his watch that that happened. And then you tell his supporters well, this guy, he didn't fire Fauci. This guy, he promoted the vaccines. So so why are you blaming the Democrats for that? You have to look in the mirror sometimes. I mean, both sides do this stuff all the time. They don't look at themselves in the mirror at all. If it's not him being locked up, it's Hillary that needs to be locked up. I mean, they all need to be locked up. So it's just, it's a silly game of just um, the cheerleading squads. I mean, everything is just all about entertainment and ratings now. And you have to be a part of this team to defeat the other team. And I'm like, shouldn't we all be on the same team defeating the one percent? But but you can't tell people that. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you would think it's just that simple, but um, SL, 
we're over two hours into the conversation. And oh, like wow. I said, and like I said before, if you want to come back on, you have an open invitation to come back on within the next month or so to discuss on um, these very important issues that affect us. Um, but do you have any departing words? And also, how can my audience reach you in case they had a question or comment and they want to reach you on one on one? Okay. Uh, well, you can uh, find me on uh, Twitter at uh, uh, Canton2030, uh, 2030. And uh, just, uh, you know, I mean, I hope I was able to uh, say something that was uh, useful uh, to your audience. Uh, because, you know, so I do uh, some podcasts on my own and then I write, uh, mm -hmm. you know, but I spend like a whole day. Uh, planning the words, the flow of the message, and all of that uh, very carefully. And now we're just uh, sh shooting the breeze, and I'm uh, uh, but thinking uh, the spur of the moment. So I hope that uh, well, your audience uh, found it useful, and I would uh, would definitely love uh, to come back on your show again. Yes. Um... You you have to check out SL Substack. Um, I'm going to link all that in the description, his Twitter page as well. Um, like I was telling the SL off the air, there's a lot of people that um, I sort of follow. I'm like a ghost on Twitter. Um, I really have a ghost Twitter account. I only share my content, and I don't I don't engage with anybody or anything. And um, there's just so many toxic personalities on Twitter. I love some of those toxic personalities, but you can love them from a distance. I'm not going to get in any arguments on Twitter. And so I had to bring SL on because he was one of the same voices on Twitter. And he actually sticks to the information and the facts. And um, I've learned so much from SL in the last month, I'd say, once I started following his Twitter page. And um, I appreciate you again coming on the show. And I can't wait to talk to you soon. Beautiful people. We have Cecilia Prado. She's going to come on tomorrow to talk about um, some of the union movement around the country, some labor movements, her previous work in Nashville, Tennessee. We have Gavin Bonney coming on Friday to discuss his 2024 presidential run as an independent. Next week, we'll have Margaret Kimley from Black Agenda Report, um, who's going to come back on the show again to discuss uh, three of her articles that she published um, in the month of March. We have Medea Benjamin coming on towards the end of the month from Cold Pink uh, to discuss her book about Ukraine, Russia that she co-authored. We have Norm Finkelstein coming on at the end of the month as well. My dissertation director, Dawn Duke. We have lots of other activists, Constance Every. She's running for the mayor of Knoxville, Tennessee. She was on my forum in episode two when she ran for the governor of Tennessee. So we have quite a few people um, and that's not even um, half of the people, I think, in the upcoming month of April and May. And I have to plug in my dad coming on in May for the episode 50. So um, we have quite a few people um, on the show. Please follow Kiko's Free Thinkers Forum. Subscribe on our YouTube channel um, and our Spotify or any of your podcasting platforms of choice. We're available there. Um, SL, thanks again. And beautiful people, we'll talk to you soon. My people in India, I appreciate you, and we are talking in a second, okay? Cheers. <laughs>